Hello everyone and welcome back to the Cop Bite Podcast. I'm Mick and I'm joined as usual by Jay. This is the first episode of one of our new shows on the channel. It's called Famous Fans. Now, if you're old enough to remember, you'll obviously remember that 21 Seconds tune back in 2001 by So Solid Crew. Our guest today is a founding member of the band who were pioneers in the UK music scene back in the day and helped create and shape a whole new genre. He performed on a song which is one of my favourite tracks, Rap This by Oxide and Neutrino, back in 2001. He then went on to run a solo career, was quite handy on a football pitch himself, and is a huge Liverpool fan. It's of course Harvey. Welcome Harvey, mate. How are you doing? Hi, I'm very well, boys. Yourself? Yeah, good, good. How about you, Jay? Good? Mate, I'm buzzing for this one, bro. Really, really buzzing. <laughs> Yeah, no, like that's, the... that, that, that's good, lads. That's good, man. Hey, listen, you're, li- you're, li- you're Liverpool boy, so I owe you loyalty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just like to say thanks for coming on, Harvey. Obviously, we appreciate any time you taking the time to come out and speak to us like this, on, especially on our first first show. One of these, we'll, uh, we really appreciate it. So we'll, we'll just crack straight on. Um, how did you become a Liverpool fan? Well, this is what actually gets me quite mad. But if I'm sometimes tweeting or you know, winding up Man United fans or other fans that I have banter with, they're always like, you are, are you copying Scouser? But no one actually takes time to dwell into my past. Now, people don't realise that a lot of my family are from Tuxef. They're from also over the water, Heswell. So I've grown up around it. You know, my, my little cousin played, played for Liverpool. My cousin was actually the nephew of David James. People didn't know that. So... Oh. I've always had a lot of links um, with Liverpool Football Club as well as being friends um, with the players. It's been, ever, ever since I've been born, it's, it's all I've ever known. Um, naturally, being a Jamaican boy, um, John Barnes was a massive factor in our, in our household. So, you know, your dad always used to say to you, um, well, my stepfather always used to say, you know, John Barnes played through racist times. He dealt with a lot of adversity in the times that he played because it wasn't, it wasn't multicultural like football is now. So, um, yeah, that, that was a big factor, too, for having family from Liverpool and Johnny Barnes being a Jamaican. I love that, mate. I love that. That's like you said, people won't know that, and that's, that's brilliant. I love it. Yeah, so I'm, love not, it. I'm, I'm not an armchair fan. I haven't just come on the glory board. No, 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 no. I've got scousers in my family. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I already knew that you were a Liverpool fan, obviously, and I've seen a few pictures recently, and I thought I'd reach out to you. And obviously oh. you came back to us, which I would obviously hugely appreciate. So thanks very much for that. No worries, bud. Um, we'll, we'll just crack on. Uh, who were your f- favourite players growing up? Well, this is actually quite quite funny. So considering my music career, I've you know I've I've made songs with Christina Milian. I've toured with Eminem. People always go to me, "Wow, what was it like working with them and meeting them? Was they your favourite people?" And I was like, "No musician." is iconic to me more than a Liverpool player. So the player that I idolised, and he's going to laugh when he sees us because we're, 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 we're friends, um, was Robbie Fowler. He's have a Robbie Fowler scrapbook. <laughs> Love like, that. Oh, Robbie mate, was, God. Yeah, God, man. Like, you know, great finisher. Um, you know, Liverpool, we've always had great centre-forwards. Going, going back from Rushy, you know, and, and all, all the legends. And yeah, when he, when he came along, because he was kind of just a, just a bit older than me, that, you know, they was magical days. The fastest hat-trick against Arsenal. Um, just his impact. Just a natural-born finisher, man. Yeah. You know, do you know what oh, I mean? And he's incredible. A, and he's a scouse lad. He, he, was, he was homegrown. So um, I was absolutely obsessed with, with um, Robbie Fowler. No, oh, mate. I'm totally with you on that one, pal. He's my hero. So, yeah, I'm totally... You, you can't, growing up and watching him, it's just phenomenal what he could do on a football pitch with so little room around his feet. Somehow he always managed to put the ball in the back of the net. It's just, yeah... You've, you've just summed it up there, really, mate. Oh, what a guy. Can't great wait to see this. Didn't have a lot of pace, do you know what I mean? Which was mad, but he had great movement. Great movement, very clever. And like I said, one of the, you know, once Robbie Fowler's in front of goal, you might as well turn your back because there's only one place that he's going. Um, very, very, um, very rarely missed the chance. Um, just that obviously, I didn't feel he hit his full potential with England, but I don't think he got a fair enough chance. Considering yeah, he, he, was one, he was one of our... our him and Ian Wright have always the weird ones. Two of the best strikers I've, I've watched, but never yeah. really um, got that England platform, considering they was probably one of the most consistent, um, two consistent strikers in the Premiership at that time. Yeah, no, it's a really good point, mate. And like you said, it's, it's a wonder. I mean, obviously, we were blessed as a country to have some, some fantastic strikers in the 90s uh, from an England perspective, but it is shocking how, you know, Robbie just didn't get more games than what he should have done for England. It is an absolute shame. Yeah. And, 
but then again, we be, we benefited that as a club then, really, didn't we? Because he was playing exactly. for us. So, exactly. Like, he scored a hell of a lot of goals. <laughs> certainly did, mate. 186 yeah, goals, did. incredible. Um, well, it's been, you know, you look forward to, you know, the 90s was a, a tough time for us as a club, really. And then, obviously, we, we had the, the bright sparks of Robbie and Stevie Mack and then the likes of Patrick Berger coming to the squad and stuff like That's that. Right. 2001 uh, was a massive year uh, for Liverpool in terms of, of trophies, you know, the treble, the five trophies in space in a few months. But also, mate, it was a massive uh, year for yourself uh, in terms of your career, which is unbelievable. I mean, just wondered, like, did you manage to watch Liverpool at the time, given how much success you were getting? Did you, how did you follow the Reds back then? Well, if you spoke to any of the boys, obviously the internet wasn't as easy to access football around them times. But um, if you spoke to any of the boys, they'd be like, trying to find Harvey in an arena is probably... I'm um, trying to find out the football football results <laughs> in the catering room. <laughs> he's um he's probably got his Liverpool shirt shirt on in rehearsals. So everyone is so solid in the arms of like, well, me and Mega Man are both diehard Liverpool fans. Super, so super there was good. always a way. There's no way when it got to three o'clock clock on a Saturday or seven forty five in the midweek, I'm not knowing what's going on at Anfield yeah. or away from Anfield. It Liverpool's my life. It makes my it makes my it makes my world tick. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Oh, love it, man. <laughs> love it. But like you said, I mean, you know, such a massive year for you. You know, you must have been on cloud nine. You know, your, your team's performing, the winning trophies, and yeah. your career's taking off, mate. I mean, what what are you you had? It, you know, a couple of years you had, obviously, but then, you know, sort of the, 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 the climb of, of the band and stuff like that must have been an incredible feeling. It was amazing because, like I said, that was our first number one. We actually formulated in 19, 1999 on the underground circuit. Yeah. But... Like I said, what was weird for me that when I used to go and watch Liverpool play back then, I remember like I used to save money, literally. And when I used to play in London at QPR, because the guy used to support QPR with me, I'd get my 13 quid and just, just literally sneak out of my house. My mum didn't even know I went to Loftus Road. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, go, and go and watch Liverpool play. I think Nigel Clough scored that day when I was a young kid at, at Loftus Road. And um, what was um, crazy then was that the amount of players that from Liverpool that I idolised that became fans of my music. So. Yeah. Within that year, I went to dinner with John Barnes. It was just so bizarre. Um, um, I played in a charity game with Steve McManaman and Robbie Fowler. And they're coming up to me going like, you know, my kids love your music. And I'm really trying to play it dead cool. <laughs> 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 I'm going, cheers for that, mate. Thanks a lot. Yeah, um, <laughs> so it was weird. I remember going to dinner with John, John Barnes at the living room. And Barnes is a good friend of mine. And I'm going like, Barnes, you're absolutely my hero. And he was like, Harvey, shut the fuck up. What are you going on about? And I was going like, <laughs> I was going, I can't believe I'm sitting with you. <laughs> Fucking hell. So, so that was li literally in 2001. A lot of players, I was getting invited to Anfield a lot uh, by all the, you know, all the corporate side of Anfield because they knew that me and Spoonie was Liverpool fans. So yeah, that's when I started going football on a corporate level. And then, you know, I didn't really know about going, that you're going to get tickets to go in the bar and actually see the players. And um, one of the first players that actually came up to me was Cara, Cara's top man. Yeah. Legend. Yeah. Legend. He goes, lad. You, 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 like he goes, fucking love the music, lad. I was like, well, cheers, Carol. <laughs> you like, cheers, mate. Yeah, so. Oh, I and then um, I met CVG at the PFA Awards. And I'd never, ever forget it. Um, I was on the VIP table next to him. Gerard was with Crouchy and all the other lads. And he put his arm around me. He said, listen, you're a big Liverpool fan. He goes, anytime you want to come to Anfield, I look after you. And like, every time I bumped into Stevie in the players bar, he was just an absolute like um, gentleman. Him and Cara and became really good friends with, with um random everyone thinks this is um Sammy Hippier. Oh, what a hero. Sammy. Oh my god. Yeah. I met I met Sammy in a nightclub in London. He went to me, he walked up to me and went, Do you mind if you take a picture of my wife? She's a fan. I was like, I got it. Are you taking a pic? <laughs> <laughs> so that that whole two years from 2001, just meeting the players, starting to have their numbers in my phone. Yeah. It was just Crazy, and as everyone knows, a long-term friend always used to invite me up. Him and his wife I used to go in his box was Mar Martin Skirtle. Skirt, mm. it's me and Skirts are like like that, you know. Um, I done a Beats by Dre deal with him. I got him some um headphones for the for the is it Slovakia, his country. I was getting yeah, Slovakia. Yeah. Slovakia. He um at the time I was an ambassador for Beats by Dre. He, we knew um we shared the same friend, and he he rang me up, Martin, and said um can you get me some customized Slovakia headphones from Beats by Dre. And I remember literally like getting about 100 headphones delivered to Anfield from Martin Skirtle. <laughs> yeah. 
and um, he kindly invited me in his in his box. It was the day that we played Southampton at Anfield and we drew one all. And funny enough, Sadio Mane scored for Southampton. <laughs> yeah, oh, at Anfield, which was absolutely yeah. crazy. It's bizarre looking back at that, isn't it? Wow. Fucking hell. Yeah. So that was oh. that was crazy. And at the time, that's when my um I think Klopp just started um started to come because it was kind of skirts his last year. And Scott said um Skirt said to me, the training, the 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 intensity, the levels that this guy guy expects. He said Skirt was like, I wish he came when I was younger to experience it. Because I think at the yeah. time he knew he was on the on the on the way out to Turkey. Yeah, absolutely, mate. And I, I, you know, uh, Stevie said the same thing, didn't he, when he was um doing some training when he was coaching the uh, the under twenty threes, he was the same, wasn't he? We was just like it was unbelievable uh, yeah. the way Klopp is and we, you mentioned Steve before, and obviously we all know what a great player he is. You know, fucking hell, we could, we could spend three hours talking about um, Stevie as, as a minimum of three hours. could go all day, couldn't you? But obviously during the period of 2001, he starts to, you know, lay his marker in that midfield. And then a couple of years later, he matures and he ends up lifting, you know, the, the old big ears for, for Liverpool number five in Istanbul. Yeah. Um, mate, mate, was you there for a start? Where was you when you watched it? Do you know, I was actually mad. I actually watched it at my dad's house. I was actually meant to fly out there with um with Spoonie to Istanbul, but um work work came up at the time because I said it was intense, so I couldn't get out there. But um, it was one of the the greatest, probably one of the greatest nights of my life, even more than I'd say the Madrid, just because we came back from three 0 down, and something that you think, look at that, that AC Milan team there, you you know Crespo, Maldini, Shevchenko, Nesta. I could carry on, Gattuso, so much great players. Italians don't give away a lot of goals in general. So I was like, how? I was like, the game's over. This is the what? This is the most heartbreaking final I've ever watched in my whole life with Liverpool. And when we came back, I knew. I remember, I think Stevie G came out second half. He came out quite early, and I could see like he just had the, he just had something in his eyes. Like he, he something said to me, "This ain't over." I don't know why it, his body language said that to me, but I think he just said, "Fuck it." We've got nothing to lose. Might as well just go for gold. And wow, what a night. I, I still could picture Kara running off after the penalty was saved by Jersey. Yeah. And, and just, <laughs> he, was like a ten, he was like a 10 year old running across the school playground, wasn't he? It was, wasn't um, it? He, fuck, he, he fucking left Jersey, didn't he? he was, everyone else was running to him. He was like, I'm fucking going to find him, my dad. He's he was gone. And his family, as you know, Kara's family obviously he's he's Mr. Liverpool, him and Stevie Gerrard. So like you said, all his family was in the stadium and oh it was amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing evening. Yeah. Got a good relationship with that trophy, haven't we, haven't we? Of course. Listen, definitely the, the the Champions League, not a mystery to us. The Premier League <laughs> up until <laughs> cool blind, I've seen a lot of pain in my time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then obviously, like we just touched on, the, the amazing night in Istanbul was number five. And then obviously, June 2019 in Madrid, we got number six. How special did that feel in comparison to Istanbul for you? Oh, I felt amazing because I, I'm sick of the Manx giving it Charlie Big Nuts all the time. Do you know what I mean? So I thought, yeah, let's get another one and stick that in their face. <laughs> so, yeah, it was amazing. That was a weird, a weird final because... I never thought at any point we was going to lose it. I wasn't nervous. It was, it was weird. It wasn't like, you know, you get, like when we played Real Madrid the year before and I was like, oh gosh, what's going to happen here? And I, feel, I felt that in the first half against Real Madrid, we played better than we did in the actual Champions League the second year. And we lost. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't, we didn't play that great in the final. But um, I just thought we just got too much for them as a squad. Um, I, I thought they can't handle our pressing. And I, thought, I felt that Tottenham freezed. Yeah. That day, and yeah, I was. It was a weird one. I knew he was going to win it. I just knew. I knew, yeah, well, just knew Tottenham didn't have the minerals. I, I yeah, just knew. That's, 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 we won it in the semi, didn't we? The semi final, we we won it, didn't we? That's when we really, you know, we, and we technically didn't lift the trophy that day. But that's when you felt, yeah, we've got this now. Barca, Barca semi final, unreal. The Real Madrid loss, obviously, like we, we you just touched on there, Harvey was absolutely. It was devastating, but I think that gave us the platform for the year after. Then go. We cannot fucking lose this one. There's no. There's no chance we're going to lose this one. And as much as a probably one of the worst finals you can ever watch, ninety minutes wise in terms of action, there was nothing. Nothing happened apart from Allison making loads of saves, literally getting a penalty early on and like kind of sitting on it until Enrique gets a goal towards the end. There wasn't much in it, was there? It was such a buzz. Like I said, it was a bizarre final. It wasn't. It definitely going to go down as one of the greatest finals in history. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. But, um, <laughs> 
it, it was just yeah, it was just a weird one. But I just as the game kept going on, I thought we could be out here all day. Tottenham are not going to turn us over. And uh, but luckily, Allison, you know, he was sharp. That's what you pay that money for. When you pay that type of money for a goalkeeper, um, you, when he, you know, when you call upon him, you expect him to be on point. And as as we know, Tottenham got a great front line. I think that's the second, probably the second best front three in the um, in the Premier League, apart from us. Especially when Gareth Bale's going to be ticking this year, they're going to be an absolute problem. So um, to keep Son, Kane, and the, you know the, the middle, which was powerful at the time, Deli Ali playing off Kane and whatnot was. It, yeah, it was a big thing. A good, good thing we stayed on point. And I, like I said, I knew I knew we was going to win it. Tottenham, they just was too nervous. They, they, they haven't been there before. We've, we've been in that high pressure many times. And Liverpool, we never do things easy, do we? <laughs> we love, That's we, a good point, mate. We love a comeback. So I'm used to having bad nerves with Liverpool. I've got no nails because of Liverpool. So, <laughs> That's yeah. why I'm fucking bald. And you're not <laughs> wrong, all of us. I've just had a hair transplant, mate, so I'm not far behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a number. Let I me, will let do, me know what it is. It's past the number. On. <laughs> I will do. You know what? I saw on your Instagram earlier, and I was like, Harvey doesn't need a hair transplant, does he? I was like, sure, surely he's all right. <laughs> the, front, the front of my hair was going, but no one associated because they think, oh, he's got, he's got lots of hair. But obviously, I'm at home. I see my hair. It started to go, go thin at the front. But luckily, I've addressed it. I got the transplant about five months ago, luckily before it um, kicked in. And now it's like being a new man. <laughs> My wife fancies me again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at the same question. <laughs> yeah. That's a brave man to admit that, do you know what I mean? Like, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a bit more, it's a bit, a bit of a taboo subject. And then obviously Wayne Rooney went through it and it was kind of like, at the time it was like, what the fuck's Rooney doing? Getting his hair sorted. And then you can see it now. I think Shaqiri was going bald and now he's come back with a full mop. Well, <laughs> and Mane, if you notice, I said the other day, I clocked it, I said, Mane's had a transplant. Because I can see it. I can see the front of his hairline. I can see the hair growing back. But <laughs> one, of my, one of my mates who's very connected in the transplant world went, yeah, Mane, he's, he's definitely had one, Mane. So I was going, <laughs> I was going Sadio's going to look, look 19 in about two months. <laughs> Fucking <laughs> okay, no. hell. Oh, mate, I'm getting that number. I'm fucking getting mate, that Mate, listen, you get a half price if you come through me too, so I look after you. <laughs> get that affiliate link going. Absolutely. You're not wrong. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, yeah, no. obviously then, Harvey, we'll, we'll, we'll fast forward a year later and we finally ended the 30-year wait. We had to go through a pandemic. We got that sexy trophy that Jay's got in his studio there and we, we lifted the elusive 19th title as a Liverpool fan. As a Liverpool fan, how did it feel going through all that and watching Henderson lift that trophy? How did it feel? It felt unbelievable. And naturally, when, you know, coronavirus hit us, I said, why does this have to, have, have to happen in the year that we're 25 points clear and now we've got our 100 days of football? And even with Gospel Truth, within that 100 days, I said, they're going to avoid the league. They're going to avoid it. And I, uh, I said, I'm going to wake up one morning and I'm going to see Sky Sports breaking news. And I said, there is no way they can do this. After the football that we played that season, unbelievable. Minus losing, you know, a couple of games, you know, we was absolutely unreal. And it was just so... I can't, I can't believe it's happened in, it happened in the year that we won it. But when they restarted the Premier League, I was absolutely buzzing. And... I feel for the boys because I feel for the boys and I feel for the city because as you know, Liverpool fan, Liverpool's a hard working, honest town. Do you know what I mean? And they deserved that madness. They deserve to celebrate with the players. They deserve to be in the stadium. And I think that's the only thing that's really hurt is the fact that, you know, about 10 of us was planning to come up for the last game and, you know, just go on the piss in Liverpool and just, be on the streets with the fans and just enjoy it. So that's the only thing that's a bit of a downer, that we had to sit in our houses. I had to sit in my houses, you know, with, with 10 Peronis and get drunk by myself. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it was amazing. It's amazing. And, we, and we've done it. And, it ain't, and let me tell you something right now. We're a problem again this year. We're a problem. Yeah. 100%, yeah, I think, mate. I think, like you said, it's, it, last year it was, it was a case of us just being far too good at every aspect of the game for anyone else to even deal with. And I think, I looked at, earlier today, I looked at the predictions of some of the pundits for this year, and it made me absolutely laugh, because it's like, City have lost 5-2 to Leicester last week. That's right. And you've got like Chris Waddle saying, uh, Man United are going to finish top of the league. It's like, 
Chris Waddle, what, what are you smoking, mate? Jesus Christ. I ain't got a clue. Listen, whatever Gander he's smoking, mate, he needs to stop smoking it. Because, <laughs> you, know, you know, in Liverpool, people like to hate us. You know, they, 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 they hated that we won the league. You know, they, people are, you know, they're very jealous that we look like we can dominate for the next three to five years. You know, um, and they know that with Klopp's philosophy, the whole way he, he creates a team. He ain't just about one player. And I didn't panic, you know. Everyone was going, he hasn't signed no players. He hasn't done this. And Chelsea were very active in the market. You know, spent a lot of money. City is a no-brainer because, they, you know, they got stupid funds. So we knew that City was going to buy. But what people don't realise, what I agreed with what Klopp said, why is everyone in England so obsessed with buying players? Do you not yeah. understand that? If you work with the same squad, adding just a few additions here and there, they understand each other inside out. They know every move. They know who's going to make that run. They know each other. They've played with each other, these boys, now for nearly three years, solidly. So that is the difference. Look at Chelsea. Went to Stamford Bridge the other day. It was like a kickball session. So easy for Liverpool, you know? Minus a few little attacks ahead. But that shows we look like a team that's played together for three years, and they look like a team that has new sign-ins and is very disjointed. And it doesn't mean that just because you spent 100 million in the market or whatever it is that they've spent, that a team's necessarily going to gel and just go on to fly and win the league. No. Like I said, it's about team spirit. It's about knowing the players that you're playing with. And Liverpool do. They do. Because like I said, they've been solid for the last three years. Minus adding Van Dijk to the equation. Alisson, we paid for the quality this year. Thiago, who's going to be a legend. And young Jota. Great investment. He Klopp doesn't just buy for the sake of buying. Yeah. Uh, do you know what I mean? I do yeah. believe we need a centre half, another centre half. Yeah. But that's my point. I would love. I would have loved to have seen Kula Bali at Liverpool. Um, just for a great player. Sometimes, great player. Yeah, just for the away game. Sometimes when you go mm. Palace away, Burnley away, sometimes you just need two bigs. Virgil having someone big next to him. Where I feel yeah. that Joe's a bit more of an athlete. Yeah, yeah, no. it makes sense, mate. Yeah, it does. It makes yeah. perfect sense. So, yeah. that's, my, that's probably my only, like, oh, yeah, we could have got a bit of a, a grittier centre-half. But um, uh, the future's bright for Liverpool, mate. It's, it's, it's very bright. The, the midfield's superb. Um, the front three's a no-brainer. Now we've added Jota and Minamino to the equation. And Thiago, you've seen what he done in one half against Chelsea. Yeah. 75 passes. Like it's nothing. He wasn't even looking at some of them balls he was switching. So <laughs> well, yeah, it, it, I, I was like, yeah. what, it, what am I? And the guy's never even played in the team. He signed on a Friday, travelled on a Saturday, played on a Sunday. I was like, that's what you're paying for. That's what, yeah. world, that's what world-class players do. They adapt straight away. Correct, mate. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's, it's telling, isn't it? Because like you said, like Chelsea went out and they were buying all these players. Havertz, Werner, who we were closely linked with, who... Most Liverpool fans, me and Jay included, obviously thought we were going to sign. And it, 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 was disappointing. it was disappointing at the time, but you think, well, if it doesn't happen, it's not going to happen. And if, if Klopp wanted this guy, he would have probably got him. That's, that's mm -hmm. the bottom line, really. Correct. But I just want to get your opinion on, obviously, Jürgen Klopp. He's, in my opinion, he's an absolute genius. Like, I know Arteta came out after, the, um, after we beat them saying, like, we've been together five years, they've been together for, like, however months, and it's, it's, it's a long process. They want to be where we are. And it's like, we are now at the pinnacle where everyone thinks that we're the team to beat. And it's such a great feeling, isn't it? And when you look at the numbers, like, I look today, like, we've spent just over 500 million in, in total in transfers in five years. Yeah. And you look at Pep Guardiola, he spent 400 million just on defenders. It's like, <laughs> who's, who's doing the recruitment right? The only people that have stayed at that club is Walker and Laporte. And That's Laporte. right. And it's like... It, what, what, what do you make of Jürgen Klopp and how much, how, how much good he's done for the club? The guy's a genius. And I was a big fan of him when he was at Borussia Dortmund because that Borussia Dortmund team that he had, wow, what a team. And I remember watching them, I was like, this team plays with so much intensity. Um, when they attack, they attack with purpose. And I, I noticed that every player in their team at the time, they were just athletes. And he demanded so much, literally, from, from this team. And at the time, like I said, Borussia Dortmund were hitting heights that they shouldn't really be hitting because Bayern Munich, as we know, dominated German football. Um, so when, I, when Klopp came about, I knew about him from German football. And I knew he was a genius. But when he actually got to Liverpool, the way he man manages the players, the, the spirit, the togetherness he's brought back to Liverpool, 
um, the way he carries himself, um, how loyal he is to his players, and also he doesn't take shit of his own players. It's his way or the highway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I just think he's a great... Anyone could be a manager and have all these great resources of great finances and a great chairman. But at the same time, you still have to know how to manage your players and get the best out of them. And I've never, ever looked at a Liverpool player in the last three years and gone, he looks really unhappy at Liverpool. He Good looks point. really, really sad. And that's honest because problems do happen on the training part. Not everyone's going to like a manager. But just the way he treats the players and the way you can see by the way they hug him, they, they play for him. The day Liverpool's players stop playing for Jurgen Klopp is the day he's got to leave because every, every player plays, plays, for, plays for Klopp. And not just the world-class players. He's turned players with great potential into now world-class players. Andy Robertson, Trent. You're like, we now have the two best fullbacks in the world. Unbelievable. So he's got an eye for a player. I also like the way that he doesn't rush players when he signs them to play straight away. He lets, because he knows that they've got to get used to the intensity that we play with. They've got to get used to the formation. If you look at Jota on Monday, you can see he was lost in, in moments, just trying to find where he's meant to play along the front three. And you can see that that's going to come with time. Great player, Jota. But he's got to learn that system. It's not an easy system to play. And like I said, unless you're an athlete, or well, you can close down, you don't fit, fit, fit in Klopp's plans. <laughs> you're out of there. Sure. So, it's, it's, um, the guy's a genius. The guy's an absolute genius. He's my hero. In Klopp, we trust. Yeah, and I, I couldn't say any better, honestly. Should we stand up there? Don't even try and top that, Mick. Don't even try and top that. Move on to the yeah. next question. <laughs> yeah. No, for me, like you touched on there, Harvey, there's so many players he's turned to absolute dynamite. And even for me, like the Sadio Mane, we signed him at 34 million. If you if you type in Sadio Mane, signed to Liverpool on Twitter, and you find the, the actual tweet that Sky Sports tweeted, Sadio Mane signed to Liverpool, it's a load of comments going, who's this guy? He's a waste of money. He's not going to be any good. He's a overhyped Henrik Mkhitaryan. And it's like, you look back now, now like six, four years on, and it's like, He's probably one of the best players in the world, and that is down to Jurgen Klopp and the way he manages players. And he, he just he knows how to get the best out of them. And I, I just want to give him a hug. I honestly just want to give him a hug. Literally. <laughs> the guy's a genius. Sadio, and I find that quite um, funny that that fan said that, because I remember watching him at Salzburg. I remember they always produce good players. Very, they always produce good, good African players too. And then at Southampton, he always gave us problems when we played against him. Always. They destroyed us one time at St. Mary's. He, and he just absolutely took the mick out of us. So for me to find that, I thought when we signed him, I said, number one, like I said, it's a bargain. That's what I thought. And it's a no-brainer. The guy's rapid as they come. The quickest feet you've ever seen. He attacks with purpose. He's strong. He's fearless. So I think that at the time, he wasn't such a big name in world football. And I think that's where Liverpool fans panicked. Oh, who is yeah. he? Like I said, he's come from Southampton. And that was the year of flop transfers. Like you said, Mkhitaryan going to Man United. I can't remember if Sanchez signed that year to Arsenal. But all these players didn't hit their potential at these clubs. Yeah. So naturally, that was probably a chain of events going, oh, gosh, what have we signed now? Do you know what I mean? He, just for example, we haven't signed Pedro, who was hot <laughs> at the time. Just for example. And then, but I knew... I remember when he scored in the first game of pre-season. I think we played Tranmere or someone in pre-season. I can't remember who it was. And I said, yeah. and Liverpool fans was like, wow, how sharp is this guy? And the rest is history. Especially in particular last year, everyone was on to Mo from the season that he had before. So a lot of yeah. people was on to him. Fullbacks were closing him down early, getting under his skin. Who if I'm turned up in all the big moments? I'd say last year, Genie and Mane. Yeah. Yeah. Two... two they took responsibility and they said, you know what? We're going to take charge now. We're going to take responsibility of Liverpool on our shoulders. And they certainly did. They did, mate. And with that, obviously, talking about Sadio Mane, we had, um, we had a question from uh, Pauline Ronan on Instagram. We wanted to ask you, who's your current favourite player in this, L in this LFC team? I know it's difficult, but can you pick one? Are you ready for this? And I'm going, to, I'm, going to be, I'm going to say this because I have to be biased to the position that I played in when I was a pro. Andy Robertson. Yeah, you left footed as well, mate. Yes, yes I'm a left footer. So it's easy to say Virgil. It's easy to say Sadio. It's easy to say 
Um, Mo. But it's easy to say Fab. But you got... I like the journey of Andy Robertson. The fact that he started in Scotland, got rejected by clubs. And I remember I was good friends with Fraser Campbell. So I used to go and watch Cole play quite a lot. And I've seen him play many times. And I said, who is this left back? I said to Fraser one time. I met Fraser. Who's this? I said, this kid's on drugs. He don't stop running. <laughs> I, said, I, said, who, I said, who's put speed in his drink? <laughs> <laughs> and Fraser Campbell said to me, Harv, I'm telling you, he's the next one. And I said, I have no doubts. I was, I, I was attacking fullback myself. He said, he's the next one. I'm telling you, he went to me. Next couple of years, he went, he's going to go to a big club. And I went, oh, steady on there, Fraser. Do you know what I mean? He might have just had one good game. And now, <laughs> now look, as I, bought, as I bought his book yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love oh, Robbo. Yeah, and I love Robbo. Do you know what I love about Robbo? That he don't respect no fucker. Yeah. And I, yeah. And I love, that's what I love about him. He's a warrior. He, I love it that he gave Messi a little dig in the back of his head, told Suarez to do one. He's a mad yeah. Scotsman. I can, yeah. I can look love Robbo. Good point, yeah. mate. Yeah. yeah. We've, got, we've got another quick one that I already sent to you earlier. Steve Buckley asks, can you recite your 21 seconds verse and incorporate <laughs> the, current, the, current, the current club squad into it? Oh, but, oh what, my God. To do, my, that, to do the whole squad? Oh, my God. <laughs> How do you yeah. even do that? Yeah. yeah. Well, I could do maybe... a, I could do more of a freestyle. <laughs> I could do a little while trying to do as much of them um much of them yeah. I can. So I could say something like We got American owners. It's not like Wimbledon's old chairman, Sam Herman. Now we've got Allison in the goal. Mane. Salah, definitely better than Zidane. <laughs> 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 loving that, mate. Loving that. We all got, we all got sad when we sold Cortinio, but there's something the world wants you to know. There's only one Firmino. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yes. that's stupid off the top of my head. Super, yeah, mate. Love it. Well, I'll tell yeah. you what, what. What we'll do for Steve Bunker then? We'll get you back on because you're going to be a regular on this show now, mate. We'll get you back definitely, on, mate. and then you can do it again. So definitely. I just want to move on slightly. To we'll move on to your career. And I know you're probably sick to death of ask, answering questions about 21 seconds, but it's absolutely iconic. And did you know it was going to be a major hit when you were making it? No, not as big as it was. Um, I knew that what we was doing was special. I knew it was special. When I was in the, when I was in the studio, because a lot of us have grown up together, when I was in the studio with the boys, I said, this has never been, been done before. Um, the only visuals you've seen of like what you would call a kind of gangster rap group would come from America, Wu-Tang Clan. You don't only associate gangster rap and seeing rappers in, you know, driving fancy cars, you know, the jewelry, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you don't only see that in American videos. So when, they, when um, we actually formulated the, fan, the, the, video, uh, the plan for making 21 seconds, I knew that we were streets ahead of everyone else because people don't realise we ripped that treatment. The director didn't write the video treatment. We knew how we wanted to be introduced. We also turned down a two million pound deal from Sony because they wanted to change the production on 21 seconds. People didn't know that. And we okay. went to them. Yeah, we went, no, we're all right, mate. Went down the road, signed a cheaper deal for 250,000. People in the music industry thought we was absolutely mental. They just turned down two million, to sign a deal for a quarter of a million. And now, now who's laughing? Uh, probably one of the biggest singles this country's ever had, Urban Single. No, period, is the biggest single. This um, Urban Single that this country's ever had. It's iconic. Did I know that the single was going to go on to sell um, a million singles, as well as the albums selling over nearly five million? No, my, chain, my life changed within six months to a year. Just went from a guy just playing a decent level of football to now being a pop star. Of course, because you're, you're, you're at, Chelsea, you're at Chelsea, Chelsea for a long time, wasn't you, as a, as a schoolboy? So I was, at, I was at Chelsea as a kid, so that's how a lot of us know each other. That's why all the players that are playing that world, are, they're managers now, because I'm 41. But, um, <laughs> you know, my age group, my area, this is my area, this was my district team and people I played against. Clinton Morrison, Sean Davis, Rio Ferdinand, Jermaine Pennant. These are all my boys, we've all grown up together. These, these were the level of players that I was playing around. So, at the time, Pennant played for Arsenal, Rio played for West Ham, Clinton played, played for Palace. So, um, 
after I left um, Chelsea, I went on obviously to Barnet. That's where I done my pro. And then I've literally obviously held down a good career in the London League circuit. Like I said, I've always played in the conference all my life. That's where I was very comfortable between the yeah. conference and League Two. That level was no pro problem at all to me. So um, between Barnet, AFC Wimbledon, um, and Lewis, who I played for, that was my like three greatest seasons in football. AFC Wimbledon was unreal. I, like it was like being at a pro club. You see the fans that we had. You know, we was getting five thousand at home games. You go and play in the derby, seven thousand. You know, it was almost like being at a pro club, and it's probably two of the best seasons that I've, that I've ever had. It was at AFC Wimbledon, so shout out all my old teammates. And to see them in the Football League now, I was a part of that journey. Because when I was with them, we got promoted twice. Super, mate. Love it. Yeah. Love that. Yeah, I'm, I mean, you probably just answered it, but like, if we, if we fly back to 2001, I was a 12-year-old kid. Probably shouldn't have been listening 21 seconds as it is, really. <laughs> but it was. Like, how, how proud are you of it, like, now that you look back? I, I appreciate it now that I'm older and I can share it with my kids. And my mum used to do my mum used to do scrapbooks. I can actually look at all my memories. And the other day I converted all my um, camcorder tapes. If you can remember the old camcorders, yeah, absolutely. I converted, them to, I converted them to DVD. To DVD. And I'm talking this over 20 hours of footage of my career. And it was so emotional watching it with my wife going, "Oh my gosh, I almost forget I've done so much." Yeah, I, like yeah. it, I think, wow, and this, these, it's just a memory. They're just memories now. It was unbelievable. I, I, but like I said, when I was in the moment at the time, I didn't appreciate it because, as you know, there was so much drama. There was the price of success. You know, a lot of us went through different situations. You know, I, I had a big story which was national news. Uh, some of the boys went jail. You know, there was so much negativity. It was a bit like this. You know. The, the straight out of Compton NWA story, yeah. you know? And there's just so much going on. So because there was so much, if I try, you're probably watching it and going, wow, these boys are great, but I'll probably associate them days with some of the most stressful times of my life. And yeah. now that I'm older, now I sit back and I think, wow, what an opportunity that, that God gave me. The second yeah. best thing from not being a professional footballer anymore, being a, being a, being a star in music. <laughs> so yeah. I, did, I didn't do too bad. It didn't, mate. And then you fucking sat down having a be with fucking Cara and Gerard and Marty Skirtle and Johnny Barnes. Live my dream. Live my dream. So, like, it was, um, to see all them players come up to me and know me, that was like, what is going on? Did, did these guys not realise I had them all in my Panini book? They're all going to laugh when they see this. <laughs> yeah, They're all going to piss themselves laughing. Especially Barnes. <laughs> especially, especially if Barnes is watching, yeah? Because I, I interviewed Barnes in my podcast about three months ago during quarantine. Right. And um, uh, me and him, we, we always rip the shit out of each other. Barnes is all like, Harvey, you keep calling me old, an uncle. He goes, you're nearly <laughs> as old as me. I went, are you sure? Barnes, are you sure? You're about 69. And I'm not talking about the sexual position. Okay, <laughs> 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 oh, brilliant, brilliant, mate. Oh, I'm, I'm just going to ask a question. That, it's not in my script, but I'm just going to ask anyway. How did those many fellas come together to make a band like I know it was like at the time it was like why are these so, so many people doing this in, in one in one group and how is it possible how, how did it all come about how bizarre it's so crazy that you said that so we all got musical backgrounds so Battersea where we're all from Battersea Clapham Junction it all links up in a weird way so Mega Man's dad was a was a was, a, was um in a famous um reggae reggae crew my dad was then a reggae singer. Romeo's uncle was the guy that used to produce, um, provide all the equipment for the area. So we all had music in us, but everyone was like, Junior Harvey, which everyone knew me as, he plays football. He's not interested. We know that he can rap, but there's no way he's leaving football to come and rap in the streets. Do you know what I mean? So, mm. and when it all linked up and came together, we've all got loads of history. Like, my mum was the woman that ran the, ran the youth club, so my mum knows everyone, so she's raised half of the boys in her youth club. She knew them when they was all little shits and little criminals, you know? <laughs> so, it's like, it's like an amazing journey. It's like a fact, like, most of us have known each other since five years old. Five years old, ten years old. Me and Romeo went to same secondary school. Me and Mega was like the, the local bad boy. 
I didn't even like him back in the day, if I could be quite honest with you, before he was a prick. <laughs> yeah. And now I turn around and I go, it's my brother. Like, I love him. Do you know what I mean? I'd do anything yeah. for him. It's, it's so bizarre. Like, we always laugh. But um, it was just organic. It was, it was God's plan. It was, it was a plan that he had written for all of us, a plan that we didn't have a clue about. So yeah. what was clever about the actual record deal? The record deal was actually Mega Man's deal. And what he said to the label, he said to the label, I don't want to come out as a solo artist. Like, he goes, I've got nine other people that are stars. And I need everyone to look at these people in one go. So can you imagine our manager, Albert Samuels, Jewish guy, like lovely guy going, he, he's behind, he was the manager of Atomic Kitten and Boyzone. So can you imagine him going, now, how the fuck are you going to fit nine people on one song? <laughs> <laughs> are you all right in three and a half minutes? And then you're saying that you, got, you want to introduce nine people as stars to the general public. Yeah. I don't know how you're going to do that. Megan said to him, hold tight. Don't worry about it. Make sure I get a phone call. I'm playing for Aldershot at the time. I got sent on loan to Aldershot. I'm on the way back from training. Mega, Mega Man rings me. Harvey, can you come to EMI Studios in the West End? I said, mate, fucking 11 o'clock at night. He said, <laughs> didn't know, I didn't know that's normal in music now, starting studio that time. Yeah, true. So he went, yeah, we're there till three o'clock in the morning. All right, no problem. Went in there, I literally ripped my verse in the studio. At the time, Romeo was in the studio, Ashley Waters, obviously you know too. And I started rapping my lyric, and one of the boys had a stopwatch. And they've gone, stop. When I've gone, when I'm on a high, when I'm on a low. And I went, so I started arguing with one of the boys. Well, that doesn't make sense, because that doesn't sound like my lyrics are meant to end. It feels like there's meant to be more. But they made me stop on 21 seconds. And it was like, that's it, that's perfect, that's perfect. No, it's not fucking perfect. It sounds like it's an uneven bar. You know, you know how music's written. Yeah, yeah. They said, Meg's like, trust me, Harv. Well done, you can go home. Okay. Remember, fast forward, six weeks later, we go and sit in a meeting room, all of us. And then they played the song. And I just went, wow. This boy is an absolute genius. Wow. Nine members, 21 seconds. You can now get us on a four minute edit, which is, which is what you need for your song to legally be played on radio. Mm. And as soon as that record came out, that's when all the record labels, it was a bit like England selection. All the record labels going, whoa, Harvey, I'll take him. Oh, I'll take Romeo. Oh, I'll take Lisa Mafia. I'll take Ashley yeah. Waters. And then after the single came out, you got to realize that six of us signed solo deals for half a million pounds each. Wow. That, it, so the whole process of what Mega created at that time was so clever. He now owns so solid recordings. So he's getting 10% of each of our deals. <laughs> well, I, I said to him, now that I'm a businessman now and I control my own shit, I went to him, you smart fucker. <laughs> yeah. I went, you gave it like you was giving away your record deal, but really he's profited more. Because yeah. if you're getting, I don't know, 35 grand of each member that's signing for a quarter of a million. <laughs> yeah, it's mad, isn't it? You do the math. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. It's yeah, mad though, but, oh, big time. But what I loved about it um, was what you said there is about there's nine people, but everyone can contribute. And, you know, eyebrows were raised of how many people were in the band at the time. And I, when, when you hit the music scene, mate, I was, I was 16 and I'm a big fan of heavy metal. And one of my favourite bands is Slipknot and they've got nine members as well. And people question about that as how can it work? But if everybody brings something to the table, you can create a masterpiece. There and you that's go. That's essentially what yeah. you did. Do you know how bizarre that is that you mentioned Slipknot? Go on. I, I go to Norway to do promo for So Solid in 2006, seven. I'm in a book. My, my tour manager bumps into another tour manager. They just start having, having a chat. He's sitting with, how many, how many is in Slipknot? Four of them. Nine. 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 I was in nine. Oh, yeah, including yeah. the band. Sorry, my bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So... Next, you know, I go up to my hotel room. The, my man, tour manager goes, come downstairs, have a drink with these guys. They're on here. They're touring too. Having a beer with these guys. Just having a chat. Lovely dudes. So, man, what's the name of your group, man? The guy's like, yeah, Slipknot. But I was like, <laughs> what the fuck? So I was basically talking to two of the leads from Slipknot. But obviously, they ain't got their mask on, have they? They're just the bar <laughs> yeah, of the I've gone. <laughs> Fucking hell. I met them in Norway. How weird is all, all the groups that you mentioned? Yeah, that's mad. Yeah, they want to be fair. You're probably talking to Corey Taylor. 
Uh, fucking mate, le- like legend, and that was my bizarre, my bizarre memory of them. Crazy. So, Avi, we just want to get your your thoughts on who your favourite rap grime artist is these days. I mean, there's loads out there. There's Dave, there's Stormzy, there's Rest Street Two, there's Getz, and obviously there's Jamie and Skep that I don't know you've worked with. Who would you say is your number one in terms of who's producing oh, the best quality? Man, this is so tough because. Wretch and Stormzy are like literally like brothers to me. I love obviously Stormzy. I've got to be biased to because Stormzy comes from my area, and he went to school with my brother. So, and he's like, I love that kid. I'm so proud of him. I, I'm gonna say Stormzy just because of current times, but I wouldn't put Gets and Skepta in that because they're still kind of now old school. They're kind of a bit older. You could put them in the same genre as them artists, but I believe that Skepta's and Gets and Wretches are pioneers for the Daves, the Stormzies, yeah. and the AJ Tracys and all the new kids. But yeah. I get the genre why you put them together. So because I'm going to deal with current times. Yeah, I've got to deal with my, my bro, man, Stormzy, man. Big Mike. <laughs> Big Mike. Yeah, I, I, I could have said a load more, but I just wanted to keep it nice and consistent. Yeah, like you, you pick the elites. There's no point in naming championship ones, is there? You've got to name the Premier League. <laughs> yeah, well, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really mess with championship artists when you come from the Premier League. Yeah. Well, it was my list. I would have threw Devlin in there and all kinds of other See, like Dev's a big one to miss out, though. Yeah. Dev, if you're watching this, mate, it wasn't my fault. It was this fella right here. <laughs> Don't follow me, they were my mates. He's on, he's on my favourites, but I left them out because I thought he might not be, he may or not make you top five. But there we There's go. There's a sick though, he's a sick, <laughs> wicked artist. Great guy. Uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll crack on. Uh, and we obviously, I've, I've seen a lot about your upcoming charity match that you've set up that'll benefit a lot of charities and organisations. Harvey's All Stars versus Mar- Marlon Hayward's All Stars. And I've seen, is it true Wes Brown and Anton Ferdinand already confirmed? So I have. So any player that you're seeing announced uh, that are getting announced on me and Marlon's Instagrams is who, who's confirmed. So they, they, you know, they get offers. They get, off, they get offers from my agent and Marlon's agent. And then once they confirm, we can announce. Anyone that you've seen so far, have you seen who Marlon's just announced 20 minutes ago? No. no Stylian Petrov. Come here. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right, hello. So, say hello. hello. Are you going to show them how you sing the song? How does it go? There's something that the cop want you to know. The best in the world is what before me, yo. <laughs> and number nine. Give him the ball. Score every time. How does it go? Si, senor. <laughs> Give the ball to score. <laughs> 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 Right. Harvey, how old is she? She's three in two weeks. Oh, mate. I've got yeah. a, my, my lad's nearly three, and, mate, that's just, oh, that's melted me out, man. That's awesome. You know, mate, you know, it's the, awesome. it's, it's the best feeling, you know, how your kids can make you feel. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And they've all got their Liverpool kits, man, and... Then my son's got his Liverpool baby girl because my son's one, one and four months, you know. So, yeah, it's, it's a big part. It's weird because yeah. my missus is from Wolves. Right. So, but we don't mind. Um, she supports Wolves, obviously. But I don't mind Wolves. I don't mind. And I, I like that she Great supports a, a homegrown team. She's not a glory hunter. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So, so she, doesn't get, she does get a bit pissed off because she's outnumbered with Red in the house. <laughs> like, there's a little Liverpool staff in my son's cot. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's Love everywhere. It, man. Love it. It's everywhere, yeah. But it's nice still having that connection with your kids, is it? Because obviously it, it's, you know, when you put them in the first Liverpool kit and you have that photograph and moments like that you can share with your daughter, it's just, it's incredible, mate. And I, I just love that. Thanks for sharing that with us, man. Oh, really... any, t- any time, mate. She, oh. Mate, she, she's built for TV. <laughs> she, she, come, she comes to photo shoots. With, she came to a photo shoot with me in um, December just gone. I fought MMA. And she came to a photo shoot with me. She was literally there just on the camera, like doing the poses. And I was like, wait, wait, my miss had to drag her off the set. Said, <laughs> Unbelievable. He said, how old? He said, mate, she's two years old. She, she does not, as you can see, she doesn't lack confidence. No, absolutely <laughs> not, mate. Get her, on the, get her on the pitch for your, uh, your charity, mate. For that, You're not wrong, mate. Football. You're not wrong. Yeah, the good thing. <laughs> but um, obviously, we want to make sure that we, we help promote it, mate, and all that sort of stuff. I mean, you know, 
it's it's a great cause of but you know do you want to tell us a bit about the game about where it's being held and and, and all that sort of stuff of course yep so the game's being held up at Dorking Wanderers Football Club I'm a host of ex-legends that everyone would know from when we when we, when we was youngsters coming to grace us that day um the charities are feed the homeless Dom's food mission so um you know you're just trying to give back in these in such cold times that we're living in right now um we're just waiting for clearance to see if we can have up to 400 fans um because obviously with non-league stadiums they, they're letting certain fans in at different tiers mm. so hopefully we can get get some fans in but it was just kind of me sitting there and me and marlon brainstorming going how can we generate money for charities if we don't have the fans yeah and luckily you know we got um a company called Glossop caravans um very good friend of mine and dom's food mission that came in with the support and also the sponsorship side of things who threw a bit of money at us so it, it was just nice you know just just and especially like i said it's now very hard to ask people for money <laughs> mm, in, yeah. these, in these current times to, to do them kind of thing just to get you understand everyone's like going through different struggles and different financial issues you know nothing's mm. guaranteed and um i thought to myself i one of my friends said it to me the other day because it was my idea he said mate he goes in the darkest of times, you can always pull out some happy moment for people. And I said, that's me because I was sitting at home and I don't feel sorry for myself. And mm. I go, this is the situation that we're in right now. The whole world's in this situation. So stop fucking sitting here and sulking. And let's start yeah. brainstorming and seeing what we can do. What makes people happy? What makes people feel free? Running around on a football pitch. takes yeah. For that 90 minutes, it takes all that stress is gone. You know? Yeah. And I thought, what's going to be better than... All the ex-pros reuniting, which is good. So many players are excited to see each other again, mm. you know, and having a big piss up after, just with the lads. Well, it don't get any better, you know. Yeah. So, um, we're we're definitely gonna keep this going. Um, we're gonna grow it. We're currently speaking to Real Madrid legends at the moment about going over there, and um, naturally, I want to play Liverpool legends. So, if anyone from the Liverpool legends team is watching this, give me a call, DM me, and we can get this game this game on. We can get it on. Yeah, I love oh, that, mate. Love what a game. That. Love to see it. That'd be brilliant. Like I said, I've always wanted to do it, do a Legends game. As I don't know if you don't know, I scored at Anfield live on Sky in 2005. The tsunami you did. Game. You did. Yeah, yeah. You did. Yeah, I remember. So, I remember. That was the greatest moment of my life. Do you know what I dreamed? That night, I was, I was in the bar and um, a couple of the boys went out in Liverpool. And I went, and a couple of the players too was asking me to come out. And I was like, ex, ex players. And I was like, I'm not going out, mate. I said, I'm playing at Anfield. <laughs> and me and my cousin stayed in the bar and I had literally had two Guinnesses and I went, I went to bed. And I dreamt about this moment. And one thing I said in the back of my head, I remember at, when we got to the game, Harry Redknapp said to me, Harvey, you still play. You're fit and these guys are scared of you. He went, and I went, and then he went, I said, who's scared of me? And he went, Alan Anson. I said, Alan Anson. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, so I went, he goes, they're all legends, but they can't run no more. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I remember, I think Alan Hansen and Bruce Grobbler like having banter with me, and Alan Hansen was talking to me on like on the halfway line, going, "You better slow down, you. I've heard about you." <laughs> and I remember literally, I literally remember it. Jason McAteer, another good friend of mine, took a bad touch on on the halfway line, um, and that's very unlike Jason McAteer to take a yeah. bad touch. Yeah, he took a bad touch. I took it off him, and as I've toe poked it off him, I'm facing the copping. And I remember Alan Hansen coming towards me, absolutely shitting himself because he knows how rapid I am. Yeah. And I've literally just gone boom, around him. He's, <laughs> and when I've looked like this, it's 40,000 people live on Sky One at Anfield. I've looked around like this and I've gone, oh, fuck, I'm clean through. <laughs> <laughs> and then Brucey boy, the ledge gobbler, has actually started doing the legs to me as I'm clean through. And I'm going, it was so surreal. It was actually That's like I was, having a, I was having a dream yeah. in my bed. Yeah. And, um, and I remember it. I hit it, and I knew I hit it well. And I, and I remember Bruce, he going like this, and he didn't move, and he's went in the bottom corner. And I was like, literally, that night I was in a hotel in Liverpool. We, we had a big piss up, and I remember at two o'clock in the morning with Ian Rush, Jan Mulby standing on the table, drunk, singing all <laughs> Liverpool songs, going, "What the hell is going on here?" Oh, yeah. Like two of my two of my heroes, and I was in my room at night time, ordering some room service, pissed out my face. And um, when I, the, the room service guy got to my room, and I said to him, I said, how much, mate? As I was stumbling at the door, I said, how much? And he went to me, when you score at Anfield, mate, you don't pay for nothing. Have a good day, Harvey. And walked <laughs> off. I went, Ooh. so I went, 
Is this what Stevie Gerrard gets every week? The freedom of the sea. <laughs> 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 wow, they they treated me like Stevie G for one night. Then it was back to reality. Oh, yeah. Fucking hell, mate! That is a dream. That, yeah, I'll never forget hell. it. I could take Jesus. it to my grave. Yeah, man. We need. We're gonna try and find that goal. Do you know what's bizarre about this goal? I've got the videotape somewhere buried, I, and I've been trying to find it. And it's weird. It's, you can find any game that yeah. was on Sky. I just can't find these archives. And what's also bizarre? When I scored that day. England were playing Azerbaijan on a Wednesday and because Alan, remember Alan Hansen used to do commentary for BBC on Match of the Day? Gary yeah. Lineker took the piss out of him on Match of the Day and said, <laughs> look what Harvey done to you. And then showed the phone again on Match of the Day, I was like this. So, someone's got that footage. Whoever, if you don't find that footage, mate, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll give you a bloody gold medal, mate. Just touched on absolutely loads of legends there. And the final question we ask all our guests, obviously this is a new a new um, show on the channel called Famous Fans, but we're going to ask you anyway. If you had to pick your best five-a-side Liverpool team that you've ever seen, who would you pick? Right. Oh, God, I'm going to play two up top, one in the middle. Oh, this is tough. I've got only five. All right, Stevie in centre midfield. Yeah. Fernando up front, El Nino up front, legend. Um, I, I, I would have said Suarez at one point, but I did like the way he went on it when he played against Barcelona for us. I thought he didn't even act like he loved the club. You know what I mean? I was like, you mm. bastard. So I'm going to say El Nino up front, Torres, Gerard, and Jan Moby. Because Jan was a ledge, and people don't realise one of the best ball players, but the young kids wouldn't get it. They wouldn't get it. And at the back, Virgil and Alan Hansen. In goal, Brucey boy, Grobola. I got it. Love that. Love that. I got it. I could say Jersey, but Bruce was a legend, man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I kept it very old school, with a bit of Gerard and Torres from, from modern times. But you've got to give that up. Oh, you gotta give the players before, way before them players, the respect they deserved because they were championship winning players. Some of them players, and obviously, I love Virgil, man. Virgil's just a Mr. Cool. Yeah. Oh, mate, it's changed everything, hasn't it? Go Mr. Old Grace. I, I think Virgil could have played in any era, couldn't he? And done well. That's the bad. That's the thing. Yeah. But um, if you if you compare that to some of the ones we've had, Jay, like we've had Eric Meyer with like a Ronaldo up front, who he's played yeah. with. Follows and then he's played with pretty much everyone. It seems like Literally. that yeah. is that, that, that is up there. So it's a, it's, it's a tough one to beat that. But um, you know, surprise mate, no Robbie Fowler in that five side team. Do you know what? It's a weird one because obviously Robbie's Robbie's the god, but El Nino had such an em- impact on me, man. Torres, I don't know. It was like I was obsessed with him anyway when he played for Atletico Madrid. Yeah, and I always call him a Spanish scouser. Because he loved Liverpool. Yeah. I don't know. To this day, I always go, I always go, what the hell made you go to Chelsea? Did your agent, was your agent, I don't know, was your agent, I don't know, having an affair with Abramovich, what made you go there? You know, like, I don't, it was bizarre because if he stayed there for his whole duration until he got old, he would have been, the, he would have been a king. He was adored. Yeah. So that's the kind of thing, but, I loved him. What a finisher he was, man. I just, I just loved him. I loved him. Well, indeed, I, mate. It's I, a tough think, team. I think it's starting to now hit home when players are leaving. Like you said, Harvey, the Torres, the Coutinho's, you think they're leaving to bet the green, the grass is always greener. And they're starting to realise it's not always fucking greener. You, you love the, When you come to this club and you give your all and you do the business, you are loved more than any other club that you will go to in the world. And I think it's starting to, re, it's starting to realise now that if... I've been asked a few times what happens if Sadio Mane leaves, what happens if Mo Salah leaves, what happens if Firmino leaves. It's like, well, I think they know now people that have gone before them, like the likes of Torres and the likes of Suarez and the likes of Coutinho, that if they leave, it's not quite the same love they're going to get. And I think they miss it deep down. And I think that resonates a lot with, with these current players. And I think that's why we'll be able to keep them around for a longer time than we usually would. I think that's good. I'd, um, a good way to end for this, for this first episode of Famous Fans, but obviously... Been delighted to be joined by Harvey. He's what a, what a great guest. We could have talked for four hours there. I don't know how long it was. I've lost track how long it was, but it could have, could have been four or five hours. 
it could have been any, but it felt like 10 minutes to me. And I, I obviously, growing up as a, as a young kid, I admired what you were doing in, in oh, the scene. I appreciate that. The, Thank the, you very the much. Music, the music, I, I loved everything you did. Thank um, you. Uh, well, listen, mate, you, you crack on. Listen, thanks so much for got the family. Anytime, stuff, mate. mate. All the best, mate, honestly. Take care. Thank All you. the best, fellas. Boss Harvey, nice. yeah. but thanks, thanks for making the time for us. Well, thanks, everyone, for watching. Give us a little like, give us a subscribe, and um, keep the channel growing, and we'll, uh, we'll see you next time.